Hi, this is Betsy Smith from the National Police Association, and this is the NPA Report. We are thrilled to have it with us the Vice President of the National Border Patrol Council uh, and a Border Patrol agent himself uh, with us today, Art Del Cueto, uh, and also my neighbor. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. I, I want to be very clear so people are understanding. I do a lot of these events and I do uh, interviews and I do it under the auspice of the Border Patrol Council. I don't do it under the agency because, I, let's be honest, if I did it under the agency, they'd shut me down. Half the things I say, I couldn't say. Uh, and I think it's important. I'm very blessed to be in this position because I can reach out to the public and I can express the reality of what's happening on our southern borders. I'm not going to give you a dog and pony show. I'm not going to give you the cookie cutter answer. I'm going to give you the hard, honest truth. And I think that's what it's about. And, and it's, I'm very fortunate to be able to do this. I represent the agents. Their voices are heard through me. I say it many times. It's not a about me, it's about the agents, and at the end of the day, their voices must be heard. I'll tell you, our, I have so many things that I want to talk to you about, and we only have a little bit of time. So could you first talk about, because people recognize you, you spend a lot of time in the national media and in national politics. Tell us what exactly it is that you do for uh, the Border Patrol. So pretty much when I do all these uh, events, I, I represent the Border Patrol Council and not necessarily the agency. If I was representing the agency, to be honest, I, I, they'd probably shut me down. Half the things I say, they probably don't want me to say. But uh, I'm very blessed to be able to represent the National Border Patrol Council uh, in a lot of these events and, and you know, the speaking engagements. And obviously, when I do the news and radio shows, and I mean, it's just been a whirlwind of, of so much things that I've had the opportunity to do. And I think for the most part, so I represent uh, agents when they're, they're, they're involved in serious issues. But at the same time, I like to say that I'm the voice for these people. You know, I'm, I'm the voice for the boots on the ground. I, I always say it, I, I push it on my Instagram and I always say that it's not about me, it's, it's about the agents and, and that their voices need to be heard. And I think that's the, the majority of, of what I really focus on is to be able to express myself and be able to put the, sto the agents' uh, stories out there because, you know, th there's so many things that happen each and every day. There's so many, many misconceptions sometimes by the media itself that I think, you know, I, my, I have an important role where I can actually express things and be able to set the storyline straight, you know, pretty much tell people, hey, this is actually the way it is, not necessarily the way you hear certain media people portray us and definitely not the way some politicians think, think that we are. Well, our, you have so much media experience, and, uh, and we love watching you. Can you briefly talk about the difference between uh, Border Patrol, Customs, ICE? Because, again, you're all portrayed in the media, of course, as evil, and, uh, and people think that you're all the same. Can you briefly explain to people what the differences are? Uh, definitely. And, well, first and foremost, I got friends in all, all three branches, and I can tell you right off, None of us are evil. Uh, the reality is we, we, we care about the rule of law. And one, one of the weirdest things that I always get is the racist thing. Everyone likes to throw that racist card. It's just so easily used. When you don't have an argument anymore and you know, you're being given all the facts of the realities of what's happening, easiest thing for people to do is, oh, I'll just put the race card. And that gets so old. You know, the, there's, there's people in all three agencies that are Hispanic, uh, they're white, they're, you know, Asian, black. I mean, we have every single color of the rainbow in all three of the agencies. And we all, you know, back each other up. We're all one family at the end of the day. And, and that's, I think, what's, what's frustrating. But, you know, so you have Department of Homeland Security that was established under the Bush administration. And it pretty much united every single one of us together under one umbrella. But there is major differences. ICE is uh, in charge of a lot of the housing and detention of the individuals that are apprehended. Uh, the customs and, and, and OFO side of the, of the family, which is the Office of Field Operations, they're the ones that you see with the blue uniforms, similar to some of the ICE agents, and they work at the ports of entries. So, you know, they sit there and it, they, they hand out different immigration documents. They check people as they're coming into the country legally. 
And, and obviously there's some people that will come through there with false documentation. And there's some individuals that will come through there with different types of drugs, which is a problem, obviously. Now, as far as the Border Patrol agents, they're dressed in green. They, they wear the green uniforms. They work in between the ports of entries, not at a port. They're not at a stable, static position. They, they roam around different areas of the desert. They also roam in different areas of the northern border. And, I mean, I hate to say it because I have friends in all of them, but I'd like to say those, those guys are a little bit, uh, you know, they work in rougher areas for sure. And they deal with individuals that their sole intent is to enter the country without being detected. And that's a huge difference. But where the misconceptions come up is Border Patrol agents are out there arresting drug smugglers. They're arresting people smugglers, sex traffickers. And at the same time, they're rescuing a lot of individuals, especially during the summer months in some of the desert areas. They get inundated with 911 calls of individuals that are crossing through the desert, that the coyote, the smuggler, we call them coyotes, they leave them in, in behind in the desert. They leave them there to die. At, at some point, they're able to call Border Patrol agents to go out there and do rescues. So many times I like to say that the, the Border Patrol agents and the men and women that are out there putting their lives on the line each and every day are pretty much the nation's largest humanitarian organization right now. Well, and I don't think people really understand that. Here in Southern Arizona, we just had a, a month of 100 plus degree days and Border Patrol, like you said, is out there rescuing people because they they are so ill prepared i know when they when they try to cross the southern border the coyotes don't take very good care of these folks you guys also see a lot of heartbreaking child sex exploitation um child exploitation in general the abuse of women can you talk about that real briefly you know one of the stories I, the easiest way for me to talk about is to actually tell you a real life story. And, and, I, and, I, and I remember uh, there was a time at the beginning of, the career, of my career, I did see a very young child that was coming across the border and they were with a group of 15. And it was one child, she must have been about four or five years old. And it was with a large group. She had been walking. They, they gave up when they saw the agents. I went up to talk to this young child. Her feet were hurting. I removed her shoes from her, from, from her feet and she had a blister that was from the top right underneath your toes all the way to the heel of her foot. Uh -huh. One gigantic blister. I looked over and, and I found out who the child's parents were and I asked them, I said, you know, what were you thinking bringing this child through, these, through this desert? And you hear different stories sometimes. Well, the coyote said it was going to be a few hours. I didn't think it was going to be that bad. And you hear those and, you know, you almost understand them at a point because you understand that, you know, the coyote wants to just make money and these people are naive as to the real dangers of it. This one struck me really hard because the individual looked at me and he said, she's four years old, she can walk already, she's fine. Uh. And that was just devastating. And th this is a parent. You know, I myself as a parent, you know, when, when, when one of my children has, has had a splinter in, 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 her, in their finger, I worry and I want to make sure that, you know, they're comfortable. Here you had a parent walking in 100 plus degree weather with this child. Their feet are completely blistered. And his answer is, they're old enough to walk. And, and these are some of these individuals that at the end of the day, you arrest them, you bring them in. If they don't have any priors, you at that point, we were able to release them back to their country. Uh, during the Obama administration, a lot of these individuals, if they didn't have any priors, they would ask for asylum and you release them in the United States. Of course, they never showed up to court. But these are the parents in a lot of these situations that are putting these children in dangerous, dangerous situations. And then you have media and you have a lot of individuals that don't know the reality of what's happening, calling law enforcement the bad guys and saying that we shouldn't be separating these parents from these children. You know, I think when you see the reality of how some of these parents are towards these children, I, I think realistically, some of these kids are happy that they're at some point separated from, from some of these individuals that just as parents, they don't take care of them in any way, shape or form. 
Yeah, it, it, it's just so incredibly sad. And, and the left loves to throw out the kids in cages uh, line that the Border Patrol is, you know, separating families, kids in cages and all that. And, and I've been to the, uh, our facilities on the southern border. Nothing could be further from the truth, right? No, exactly. Now, some of those pictures that you will constantly see about kids in cages, there was a time during the Obama administration that we were getting flooded by unaccompanied uh, minors at the ports, at the ports and in between the ports of entry. So everyone was just getting flooded. It was thousands of minors that were coming in when we would ask them, where are your parents? Many of them said, my, I don't have parents. Others would say, my parents are in the US. They crossed years ago. Now I wanna come and, and reunite with them. Uh, and it was just, it was a, a mass exodus from Mexico and Central America of these minors that were coming in. There was so many, they were being detained, not housed for long periods of time whatsoever. They were being detained in areas that were built as, as cages, just so you could detain them for a short period of time, find out their nationality, find out where their parents were, and then send them off. Where I believe the agency dropped the ball is, we, have, we had a lot of media wanting to find out through the agency. and The agency has to go through a lot of red tape before they talk to the media in a lot of situations. By the time they, were, they, they finally disclosed and allowed media in those areas, obviously the media came in, they started taking pictures of just kids in these detention areas, in these holding cells, and, and, and it just spread like wildfire about kids in cages. But none of it, none of it was such a big deal to anyone until President Trump got into office and all of a sudden they started blasting these pictures everywhere. But what they failed to mention is, one, they were temporary detention facilities, not for long-term care. And number two, they were all going on during the Obama administration, not during the Trump administration. Right. And, and of course, you know, the, people, don't, people don't like to hear the truth about that. You know, you, uh, speaking of President Trump, because of your role and because of the council's role in uh, uh, originally endorsing Donald Trump and once again endorsing him uh, for re-election, you've had the opportunity to spend a fair amount of time with the, uh, the Trump campaign. And recently you were in Washington, D.C. when President Trump at the White House accepted the Republican nomination. And uh, you had upfront uh, and close uh, experience with Antifa, didn't you? Yeah, I don't know what if, what, if they were Antifa, what they are. At the end of the day, uh, the way I see it, and I may get grief for this, but I took an oath when I, when I joined law enforcement, and it was to defend this country against all terrorists, foreign and domestic. And the way I see these individuals are, these are domestic terrorism, that they want to ruin our way of life. They're against law enforcement, so that's a big red flag already. And to tell you the truth, some of these individuals, by looking at them, I don't think they know what they're asking for because if it came down to it and there wasn't law enforcement around, I don't know who they would lean on for actually help because they're not, they're, they're, let's just say they're not the most physically uh, fit looking individuals at some points. But yeah, yeah we, we came into contact with them as soon as we walked out of the White House. They were, they were screaming obscenities. Listen, I've, I've done a lot of areas where I've, been doing public speaking. And I had uh, several protesters when I spoke at the University of Arizona some time ago. I'm used to it. I get it. I understand it. But what really did upset me is there was elderly people that we were, we were helping walk to their hotels. All the while, these individuals continuously were yelling and screaming obscenities. They were threatening to rape the women. We ran into Dan Bongino, who was walking to the same hotel. We, I told them, you know, come along with us, Dan. We'll, we'll make sure everything's fine. We walked. They continued to, to, to shout out racial terms at a lot of the individuals in our group. And, and the, the, you know, the threats of rape were continuous. And nothing is more disgusting to me as to get to my hotel, turn on the television station, and hear the... the some of the national news saying these are peaceful protests. Mm. The only reason these things are peaceful is because the people haven't gotten to the point where they're fed up enough with these individuals. I pray it doesn't happen because I don't, I don't look at, I'm not a tough guy. I'm not, but I'm not going to run away from something. And if somebody is in trouble, 
and, and these individuals are attacking these people, I am fully prepared to defend myself, defend those people. And, you know, it, it just something's going to give sooner or later. And it's really disgusting to me because, you know, not so long ago, uh, we, this country was attacked. Some people forget about those things. And back then, we all united. There was no black, white, green, brown, whatever. We were all united as Americans. And it's pretty sick that it may take another tragedy for us to understand how great this country is and how we need to preserve our way of life. And the way you do that is by having uh, law and order. Absolutely. And, and there's so much talk now of defunding the police, reimagining policing, things like that. And, and one of the things that we keep hearing, Art, is, well, it's the, it's the uh, big bad police unions mm -hmm. that are helping dirty cops uh, stay in police jobs. And yet, at the same time, we hear about how wonderful the teachers unions are and right. the uh, service workers unions and the pipe fitters unions, but somehow police unions are bad. Can, can you talk about uh, your experiences with the union and your association and what you do to get rid of the occasional dirty cop that you have? Listen, no, no one hates dirty cops more than good cops. That's, exactly. that's the way I've always said it. Is, is there a percentage of individuals that have crossed that line and, you know, they, they, they go towards crime? Of course, that's in every single job, realistically. The problem is, and I get it, and I understand it, as law enforcement officers, you know, you're sworn to a duty to protect and serve. And the reality is those people that have crossed the line, there is no place for them in law enforcement. I'll never defend dirty cops. I'll never defend dirty border patrol agents. That is ridiculous. And those same people that are quick to put all law enforcement under a certain umbrella are the same ones that get upset when people put them under the same umbrella. And, and, and that's what's really eye-opening. You know, I, don't, I think that there's a percentage of individuals from every race that ruin it for everyone else. There's a percentage of individuals from every job that ruin it for everyone else that has that job. Uh, but, you know, that's why we always say we're the National Border Patrol Council. We try to stay away from the union because it does have, it, it has that bad uh, stigma, I guess, at times. And not just from far, you know, uh, people that are, oh, you're the law enforcement union. Let's face it. Sometimes there's, there's people that are for uh, law and order. There's people in, in, in certain parties that they say, well, it's still a union, so let's stay away from it. But the reality is we don't fight for pay. We don't fight for any of that. We fight to make sure that you know, agents are out there being protected, that they have the right tools, that they're trained correctly. That, that's what we are out there doing. We're not out there protecting bad guys. Uh, at, occasionally, we do do a lot of court cases where agents are being unjustly accused of being involved in a shooting, but we see and we vet all those cases very properly to make sure that we have good cases. There's agents out there that have been in trouble and we haven't represented them because at the end of the day, we are all law enforcement officers and as I've always said, no one hates bad cops more than good cops. And the over 99% of us are good cops. That's yeah. in all agencies. We absolutely are. And, and nobody gets into this job to go out and abuse people. We get into this job to help and to serve. And, and one of the, um, the largest duties of uh, the Border Patrol here on the southern border is drug interdiction, isn't it, Art? Definitely. There's a lot of drugs that come across in our southern border because our proximity, obviously, to the cartels and where they work in this area. There was a time, uh, I haven't checked the statistics too long ago, there was a time that Tucson Sector Border Patrol was responsible for over 40% of all the drug seizures in the entire country. That's how crazy it was. And to this day, we're still seeing it. We're, it's still happening. The difference now is I think we're, we're seeing a lot more fentanyl we're seeing a lot more meth and heroin come across our borders and cocaine. Cocaine is all of a sudden making a big push again. And, and, and that's some of the drugs that are, that are coming across. And a lot of these individuals, they don't want to be arrested. They don't want to go to jail. Right. So a lot of these situations, they, they have the high potential of turning violent. 
And a lot of these situations, they do everything they can to evade apprehension by agents, whether they be on foot, in vehicle, whatever you may have. But, you know, it's, it's, it's gotten a lot rougher lately than it has before. The areas where the new wall has been put up has been tremendously helpful. And what that has caused is it has funneled individuals to enter just in certain areas, but that helps uh, the agents know where they can mobilize and where they can be strategically placed. So it's, there's so many factors that are involved, people don't understand it. And, and it's silly when I hear people say, oh, well, you build a 20 foot wall, someone's gonna build a 21 foot ladder. This is what I ask, and it doesn't matter what political party you're from. When you go to a supermarket, when you go to a mall, you still lock your car doors and you lock those car doors knowing that someone can still break into your car, but you still lock them. Same with your home at night. I've said it before and, and people have, have, have heard this line and I, I don't get tired of saying it because it's the truth. I don't lock my door at night because I hate the people outside. I lock it because I hate the people, because I love the people inside. And it's the same for our nation's borders. We need to lock our borders. We need to defend our country because we love the people inside, not because we hate our neighbors to the South. There's a right way to enter this country and that's through the port of entry. And, and, and that's all we ask for. And it doesn't have to, it has nothing to do with race. Illegal is not a race. Uh, I've said it many times before. The proper way to enter the country is knock on the front door, which in this case happens to be our ports of entry. Art, that was so eloquently said. You know, what you've done today, I think, is help folks understand what exactly the patriotic men and women of the United States Border Patrol do for our citizens, for our visitors, and to help keep our nation safe. Whether it's water rescues, desert rescues, helping rescue children who are being exploited, taking dangerous drugs, off of our streets, and so many other things. The United States Border Patrol is an incredible group of men and women, and I hope you now have a better understanding of what they do. Because, you know, that's the goal of the National Police Association, is to help all Americans understand our law enforcement officers better. You know, we reach out to police officers or police departments who may need our assistance, but we also wanna reach out to the American people to help them understand how pro-police citizens can help support their state, local, and federal police officers. So if you'd like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org.